you very much. Very nice. Uh, thanks uh, also, Josh, for inviting me here. Thank you also for not asking the title very much in advance, so I could make it up just a few minutes ago and try to connect somehow what I want to say with what you are talking about. So you are talking about uh, intelligent music production, and I want to talk about uh, intelligent creation of music. So it's really pretty much the same thing, and I was trying to really try to find a, a stronger relation between these two things. And from my viewpoint, I'm older than most of you, uh, so I'm more, uh, in, as you, you can imagine, interested in music like like it was before, where harmony, melody, and things like that matter actually mu uh, much more than sound. And today, uh, I recognize it's, uh, it's, it's clearly the opposite. Uh, and to the point that, uh, I, from my viewpoint, music production used to be uh, about transforming sounds, you know, applying effects and stuff like that. And I think today, music production is more about actually creating sounds uh, not necessarily from scratch, although there are more and more synthesizers, plugins for in uh, in the, the workstations to actually create sounds. But even what we saw this morning is, as I think, more uh, to do with uh, creation and invention of sounds than uh, strictly uh, uh, processing or transformation. So in that in that respect, I want to talk a little bit about the current state of, uh, well, some highlights of the current research that we are doing, and there, are, there is an increasing number of people actually in the world uh, now really getting seriously interested in how AI, machine learning, and all that can be used or developed uh, to uh, actually create or uh, generate a new music <coughs> or interesting music. So I will, get, uh, I will just give some examples of this. And as a background, as you know, AI and machine learning, if you go to actually pretty much any conference in any domain, people talk only about deep learning. I mean, of course, computer science conferences. And uh, it's interesting to see that AI and deep learning and all that has, uh, ha has been uh, eating up the world in pretty much all the domains of entertainment, except music. So there are very interesting results in script generation, movie generation, images, um, actually, a, what they call no, style transfer, which I will talk about uh, for images, even for videos. I mean, it's really very, very impressive. But if you look at it, there is no still a big thing in, uh, in uh, music. And uh, the reason why I think is that somehow music is more difficult than all that um, and raises a lot of problems that I want to mention. But also, one of, another goal of this talk is also to show you some of some technologies or I, well, frameworks we use in uh, music generation that could possibly be used also for, let's say, uh, uh, intelligent music production and automatic mixing. So basically, the, the, the world we are in currently concerning uh, generative uh, music is, uh, and machine learning is you have a set of, uh, of examples. You call this a training set or whatever. You try to infer some kind of model, some kind of statistical model, and then you can sample or can generate from that model new things. And actually doing this is, ac is actually very, very easy with a Markov model is pretty much uh, straightforward. Even with a neural network is very easy today. Even with a deep network is very easy. I mean, it's, uh, you can do it in a few lines of, uh, of uh, Python or all these languages. Uh, and even you can do an audio now. A few days ago, maybe you have heard of that. You can also actually synthesize audio that, that way. What is more interesting and, uh, of course, more difficult is when you want to add some constraints. You want to say, okay, I don't just, I don't just want you know, any, any sample uh, from this model, but I want something that ends in C major. I want uh, these two notes to be different, and I want a sound that is more like and less like that and so forth. So all these things, we call them constraints, you know, ways that you want to uh, direct the generation. And so a lot of our work, have a, of our work in the last uh, couple of years or so has been to identify uh, techniques uh, that can solve some of these problems. And we have shown that some of them are actually very hard. Some of them are polynomials. Some of them are NP and P depends. So it's, uh, the situation is pretty complex. And, and there are lots of results now about that. And this is very interesting because when you have a, a, a type of constraint that you can impose to statistical model, then you can use this very, very productively to, to do many, many different things, not only music, but also, again, maybe production and other things. So this is a, just a picture extracted from a book that will come out uh, in two, three months about 
all the kinds of constraints and uh, the complexity of the algorithms to, when you try to impose them. I want to say something very simple right away. If you take a deep network, an LSTM, and you want to impose what we call a unary constraint somewhere, well, you cannot do it. Okay? So even very simple constraints are actually very hard to enforce, uh, let's say, with guarantees. So the problem of, again, building a statistical model is now very pretty much understood, but the problem of generating under constraints is much harder. And I want to give some examples uh, by taking this uh, experiment. We did a few, well, actually last year, where the uh, ERC asked me to reorchestrate the uh, European anthem. Of, of course, uh, well, it used to be your anthem. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am in France. Well, actually, Sony CSL is English. It's only Europe is in, uh, in England. So. And in such a way that the melody of Ode to Joy could be recognizable and also the style of the reorchestration should be recognizable. And there was another constraint, I removed the picture, but this had to be played in a big room where many people would have a drink. So they would not listen very carefully. So the, the sound, the production was also extremely important so that all these things would be recognizable with a very, very loose attention uh, you know, uh, that, that could be uh, guaranteed. So the result is on the web. You can check the video. We had a lot of success with this. Very, very nice, a lot of stuff. But I will take, I will take a few examples from this just to illustrate what I want to say. So this is the starting point, the lead sheet of Ode to Joy, the melody, and some chord labels on top of it. This lead sheet, I did it. Of course, Beethoven didn't write this lead sheet like that. But it's more or less what you, can, uh, you, you, could, ex you could do if you have a, a reasonable ear, let's say. And so this is a target structure you want, you want to fit into and take some styles and, and, and fit in this thing. And the first thing we, we had to do, the one out of the seven styles that we, we, <coughs> we generated, was Bach. Uh, it was interesting to have Bach uh, chorales in the, in the style of Beethoven, of course. It's a bit anachronic, it's interesting. And Bach chorales are actually very, very difficult to model for, for many reasons. So what is a Bach chorale? It's something like that. This is a real one. Uh, so you have four voices in that case. Um, uh, and you have uh, well, lots of things going on in, in here that I will not uh, review. But basically, the, the, the idea was to take this, extract a kind of, of, uh, tech, of uh, texture from this set of chorales and reapply it to, uh, to Joy. And, and uh, we found out that actually a very interesting model to do, to do this, this is an exercise that has been done a lot of time in computer music, by the way, but never with, with, with really very successfully, was to shift from the old kinds of model we used to use in that community, basically Markov model, to, to more powerful models used in, used in a statistical physics called uh, max entropy models, which are really able to capture long-term correlations between events, which Markov models cannot do by definition. You are limited to some context, and the context is very small because you don't have many data. And so when you have a, a choral like, like this, you have lots of interaction that occur between nodes that, that are not necessarily very close to each other, and also between nodes vertically and diagonally, and so all this is not, it's very hard to do with the Markov model, it's really very hard. So we, 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 we got interested in those models, and these are called also um, well, energy model, if you want, uh, or exponential family models, because the, the probability distribution is uh, actually uh, represented by uh, an exponential of the Hamiltonian, which represents the, somehow the energy of the system. And uh, the energy itself can be decomposed as a set of uh, interaction uh, contributions, which are all binary. And this is why uh, estimating these parameters is not easy, but feasible. Uh, otherwise, it would not be. And now, nowadays, with the, you know, the progress in gra gradient search and all that, you can actually estimate these things pretty easily, a few hours, a few days, depends. And um, so what, what you get with this is a very interesting way to, to do a back uh, choral generation. So I would just, this is a video that exemplifies the, the idea, but you take, uh, so the top soprano is out to joy, and this is a random solution, all completely random, but that, then there will be some iterations, and then progressively, the system will uh, do a Monte Carlo search and try to, to to, uh, to get a, a, a probable, uh, let's say, well, to optimize the, the probability of the, 
of the system and converges very quickly in a few milliseconds actually and you will see progressively all right a bit better some wrong notes and this one is is, is perfect so there is no wrong note in that thing. And there is no knowledge. I mean, everything is completely automatic, of course. Uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to uh, just do it again, just to show something. Uh, uh, sorry. So here, just in passing, what we have shown is that there are you know, the red stuff, white, and uh, and green, and uh, and this one is the one which works well. And the white things, the white chords are chords that were, that were already in the training set, that they were just reused, uh, copied if you want. Uh, the green ones were not in the training set, but they were in another back chorale. And the, the red one were completely invented from scratch. And so what's really interesting with those systems, when you have a very good uh, estimation of the probability distribution, that you can actually create new things in the style, and you can actually measure how much you can create. Uh, uh, which is something that we can, we can show that you cannot do with, with other models like, like Markov models. So these models are not only better, but they're also even interesting to create new things in the style. Uh, there is a lot of work currently in the lab about extending these models to handle full polyphony. Here I cheated a little bit, maybe some of you noticed, but you have, uh, what, you have vertical uh, uh, homorhythmic uh, polyphony. So you have one only chord, succeeding chord. You don't have like a counterpoint movements. So we, we work quite a, a lot with the, the guy there, these two guys to extend this uh, uh, to full polyphony and it works extremely well. So it's quite impressive. So there are a few examples here. So this is a simple, I think three voice, Bach, random walk without any constraints. This is Palestrina. There is no repetition, there is no plagiarism. It's very, very, uh, very efficient. And of course, so the, in the papers that uh, we're going to write, we are going to measure exactly the degree of plagiarism. This would be very impressive if, if I played an original Mozart piece, but most of you would not notice it's an original, it's, there is nothing new. Here, what's interesting is that there is no plagiarism, and the model is, is really able to capture a lot of uh, complex interaction going on. So the, the odd to joy exercise, you know, we, we could do that way. Uh, the paper that's going to come out at, in uh, ACM TIST is going to describe all the work done actually mostly by Emmanuel with there about the production, how to make this actually uh, sound nice in a big room and actually there's a lot of work there which I think is very interesting which we cannot model currently, we cannot automate completely. And just a few examples uh, about the recent model extensions of these models so with hidden layers where we use LSTMs <laughs> Uh, combined in a very specific way to capture all this right, you know, and to do to produce poly, uh, full polyphony with multi-voice and, uh, and, and enable unary constraints, uh, which you cannot do with LSTM. So this is, for instance, your. There, the harmony is not given, just the soprano. And so you can hear all, all the mo voice movements. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in statistic, statistical physics, they say that the, the, the system in a, good, in a good region of the, of the, you know, just before the phase transition. So there are lots of very interesting things happening. And what is kind of magical is that you don't have to do anything. It just works like that without tweaking or cheating or anything. I don't have the time, but these models are also very interesting. We have uh, been using them to model expressiveness or expressivity, I don't know. So, you know, the problem is how you go from a strict score, which is quantized to something that sounds human, you know, like a straight uh, Donali. This is just the score played with a metronome. 
and one is Jaco, of course. Lots of stuff happens concerning onset deviations, amplitude model modulation, all that. And so the problem is how can you model, how can you capture these onset deviations, these are style of expression, capture it in a statistical model and reapply it to something else. And we have shown that these models are actually very good for, to do that. There is an online test going on actually where we compare a human performance of Donali, this thing, I don't, with a random model. You can see, you can hear it random because there is no correlation between the onsets, especially long term. Well, there is no even a short term correlation, but with those models, you can, uh, you can capture and reapply those correlations on completely new things. Of course, this is generated with a training set which does not include the, the results, obviously. Okay, so much for polyphony and, uh, and, and these things. I want to mention jazz a little bit uh, because jazz raises a completely different kind of problem. So basically you give a, a lead sheet to a jazz musician, a jazz pianist, it will transform it into ways that are very different from what Bach is going to do. Bach is going to, to follow strictly the soprano. You know, the jazz guy is going to add a, a lot of stuff in between to make it sound more interesting or strange and always trying to make you, uh, you know, rem uh, recognize the melody. But there is a lot of more freedom and so in that, in that, in that respect, it's much harder to, to model. Um, so we, we have done some work with, uh, with Markov model actually here, but with uh, some of the techniques we have been developing. So I like to, to play this example for those of, you, those of you who hear a bit of harmony, maybe there are, there are no such species anymore, but uh, so this is a traditional song where you have a B flat major chord supposed to be here by tech six, and they do this, and then they go there. So what they do is very, very. See? So when you have something written B flat and you do this, you are really very far away from the, the target structure, the, you know, the, the structure you're trying to, to go to. So how can you model this? So this is not really tra style transfer, it's really about how to get away from the target but then coming back in uh, smooth, smoothly and in, in interesting ways. So we have done some work about that. I will, I will go very quickly, this is published, where we, we can, for instance, given a, a target which is these two notes there, like e, uh, what is it, e to D with those chords, and then you say oh, how many notes you want to do. Well, I can give you like two or three or eight, so if it's eight, you get this. Oh, sorry, I'll try with, with two, three notes. So a jazz man will add a, a, a chromaticism here. But if he has more notes to play, he can. Okay, or. Okay. In those, those cases, you have uh, you have boundaries on the on the star on the, these two notes, and then you give some freedom in between the E, and that we have shown that you can do this with control random walks, very very in a, with, with no complexity. Once the model is built, all these solutions are created instantaneously. So it's quite interesting. Giant steps. By the way. So if you know giant steps, you probably kind of recognize it. It's somewhere in the soprano, but there are lots of fioritures done with a training set from a Wagner polyphony. So uh, this is odd to joy. Added on top of the soprano. Especially this cadence here, which is typical of take six, which is not in the score, but uh, so we can show that we can model to some extent uh, this uh, flexibility of jazz comping. How much time do I have? Right. So, um, 
No, we could, okay, okay, so we are, we are doing a, so the third style was Bossa Nova because I'm myself a bit obsessed by Bossa Nova. It's a style I like and I know very much how to play Bossa Nova guitar. And I wanted to do something. So, so Bossa Nova is, a, is a characterized by the fact that uh, everything is wrong. So all the melodies, uh, a harmony. So you ask a Brazilian guitarist to play C major, I will play uh, something where you don't even have a C and an E and a, sometimes none of the triad chord, but it sounds very nice, you know? So, and the rhythm are crazy and uh, goes everywhere, but of course there's some logic in there. So the problem is how to capture uh, these things and, and in order to generate new accompaniments, bossa nova accompaniments. And then when we try to, to, to work on that, and this is work by the way with uh, Mathieu, somewhere there, um, we realized that one of the, the crucial difficulty was to deal with uh, onsets. Basically, in bossa nova, actually, in all the perform, perform music, uh, people don't play on the beat. I don't know if you have noticed this thing. So they play a little bit before, like here on the D9, an anticipation, or sometimes they play a little bit after. So all sorts of uh, bad things happen. So if you do concatenative synthesis, you are either you quantize everything and it works perfectly, but you completely lose the groove or you don't, and then you create lo lots of artifacts. And so we had to uh, address this issue, and uh, we, I think we got a very nice, uh, very nice result, actually. So I would just show example. So this is a human uh, guy here playing in sans uh, So you have to hear, listen to the guitar only. And you can see the rhythm is kind of laid back, a bit behind the beat. And the harmonies are, you know, these things, uh, Brazilian stuff. And sometimes it's really, it's not, it's not, it's clearly not within the bound of the beat, okay? And so we can take this and apply it to any song. So this is blue, this is blue and green, it's a jazz standard. Uh. You can hear the anticipation, everything is reproduced in a nice way. And you can do this. But you can do this also for any kind of uh, audio that, uh, that has these uh, uh, properties of being not really on the beat, like guitar strumming. So this is a uh, Friends to Go, a song by Paul McCartney. This one. So you, but the strumming, actually, if you look carefully, the, the guys always play a little bit before or after. So you cannot do concatenative synthesis from, a, a, let's say, a human recording. Uh, but we can do it. So let, this is all of P by uh, using this. So there is no uh, cheat. I mean, it's really pure uh, generation. And you can see that oh, everything is smoothly uh, concatenated, transposed, stretched, and also anticipated on that. So this is what we got for uh, Rod to do it. Of course, we added a little bit of uh, what they call production, which I used to call bass and drums. Now bass and drums is actually production. This is very interesting, by the way. Okay. So actually, I really wonder what's left for music. Everything is production. So we can do all this now, uh, pretty much. But this is a kind of, again, a style transfer. We know where we are going to. We are, we are going to, we, we have to, to stick to Odd to Joy or to whichever target. So just very quickly, we had also as a constraint to do, uh, let's say, uh, individual uh, songs, sorry, styles corresponding to individual songs, which <laughs> does make any sense for a musicologist because style, by definition, concerns a lot of uh, songs or corpus. Anyway, but uh, so the idea was to say, let's take a, one song, like uh, this song is very famous uh, in France. I don't know here. And so you can do this. Is, there is a bug in that version, I didn't replace it. The drum is going too early. 
and so forth. So to do that, it was really interesting to see that the problem at, at, at here is a different problem. It's a problem of, of generating three sequences, bass, drum, and uh, guitar, or, or depending on, uh, that fits to some uh, chord label uh, uh, structure, but uh, also so that, so that there, are, there are synchronization points uh, every now and then. And so this synchronization problem turned out to be extremely hard. It's really more than NP, it's very hard. But we proposed a solution recently in, the, in this paper, which was shown last week in Toulouse at CP, to do that in reasonable time. So what you get is this, so it shows a little bit what's going on, but here you have Penny Lane, and uh, five minutes of the moon. And you see that uh, all the chunks here are taken from the original uh, mapped into this so that it, they are synchronized uh, when, when you have a chord change. Otherwise, they are, they, they are let's say, uh, free to go where they want. It works pretty well. But it takes a lot of time. This cannot do, be done in real time currently. OK, I'm uh, progressing. Um, this is on the web, or this is on the web. I want to talk a little bit about leeches now, because this is my favorite subject. Uh, and I think this is the most difficult problem that we have in music generation. It's much harder to generate a nice leechy than to generate a symphony by Mozart. I know that if I say such a thing, people will, many people will hate me, but uh, my experience is music is really that this is a kind of true. So, uh, so we have a big database of leechy called LSD, of course, uh, with all the, the, the lead sheets in jazz, uh, American songwriters, let's say the basic stuff of uh, tonal uh, music, uh, tonal pop music, uh, until, the, well, uh, including some pop and uh, the Beatles and stuff like that. And uh, so, so I just, I'm just going to give you some examples. So there is a, we have a tool called a Flow Composer which also we, we released a few weeks ago, uh, uh, we, in which you can select a style, a set of lead sheets, and then generate a lead sheet in that style, possibly adding constraints. For instance, you have an idea. You know, you want to start a phrase, and you don't know how to continue. So all this can be done with the interactive system that we are, we are proposing. So this is just one example with Miles. I think it's 12 bars. It's a very simple example. So if you listen to it carefully, it's on the web, you can see there are lots of structure in there. There are lots of uh, similarities between various uh, bars, uh, various subsequences. So all this now we can do with uh, those techniques automatically. So this is a purely automatic generation of the lead sheet, and the rendering you hear with the piano is also automatically uh, generated with the technique I showed for the bossa nova. Another example, we wanted to do something that grows for 12 bars, but you can play in loop from miles again, Miles Davis, without any uh, human intervention. So this is what we got. Points, uh, one example. And so you can notice the, the only in, in, in human intervention that we wanted the C7 at the end well, we wanted at the end a chord that resolve onto the first, so that you can play it in loop. I can assure you, if you play this twice or three times, you cannot get this thing out of your head. It's very sticky, <laughs> very very sticky. So here, what you listen to, so the score, the lead sheet is generated, and the rendering here, bass, drum, and uh, some kind of guitar is also automatic. Everything is automatic in that case, and it's uh, as far as I know not produced. It's completely raw audio, and there is no mix. And and everything. There is a video on the web that shows what you can do with all this. And I just want to conclude with some examples now. So currently what we're trying to do, the goal now is, is not so much to prove uh, that AI is able to, uh, pro to generate interesting lead sheets because it's something we are quite convinced already. But the, the goal is, is your problem. Now, as you know, a lead sheet is not enough to make it to the radio. You, know? you have to produce it. Produ production 
is actually a lot of, uh, is more than maybe 80 or 90 percent of the work. So currently what we are doing is we are, we are producing some of the songs that we have generated with our technologies so that they sound okay so that you can put them on the radio. So we have a uh, we, have, uh, we are going to uh, announce uh, very, very soon an album, uh, several albums. One album will be uh, the next Beatles album. So I can give you an extract uh, of one song. I don't remember which one it is. It's this one or not? This one. Yeah, this one. We, you have to play it very, very loud. And so forth. I mean, it's a real, real fully fledged three minute songs, and we will have tw 12 or, or, or so. And so we can do this, of course, in many different styles. Uh, there are, again, examples on the web. There will be more soon. There are things for old people like me, like the Beatles. There are things that are more modern, like this kind of thing where, where we are using voice synthesis. This is actually, this is actually uh, the Dean Martin's voice taken from uh, Rio Bravo, uh, the song, well, you don't know, this. you are too young. But so what we're trying to show that all these techniques uh, can generate lead sheets, can generate actually also, uh, ma I don't know how to say maquettes, I mean, uh, you know, very rough uh, uh, realizations or renderings uh, with lots of different styles of accompaniment, also multi-track. Of course, from that, so this we are, this is okay now. We can do it. Now the next step is, of course, what I, how to go from these things to the thing that is playing on the radio. Uh, and so, my conclusion is actually the subject of this <laughs> workshop of these uh, workshops is really how can you go now for the next step? And uh, so we have a project uh, which I didn't talk about, and uh, if you want to talk about that, uh, Emmanuel there. Is, uh, is working on that, where we try now, based on some ex of the examples we have of real mix, we try to build an automatic mixer uh, that, uh, let's say, approximates uh, more or less what's going on. This is just an example of the Beatles song. So this is the human mix. It turns me on. Good day, sunshine in the back. Uh, by the way, this is not a professional sound engineer. It's just a good musician. In other, he's, it's not the perfect mix. But it, it's, it's a, let's say, a decent mix. And then this is uh, the, what the, 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 the system is doing on the right. It turns me on. Well, it's, it's very hard to, to compare them like this in a conference, but this is on the web. Please come and, and talk to us about that. There is a, an online demo with a whole pop album which has been mixed, um, which is an album that exists, that is for sale in France, and it has been remixed with the Automix, and you can compare. It's quite interesting. Sometimes it's really very good. Uh, there are some listening tests, and this is really the subject of this thing, and I will stop here, but I will... Uh, um, just mention as a conclusion that, uh, again, I think that uh, intelligent production is, is well, more, let's say, at, as, as much about generation and creation than, uh, than about strictly transformation. 
And so in that respect, it's interesting maybe to look at those techniques that are developed for generation. And a lot of things happening currently, as you probably know very well, uh, not only in machine learning, but there is a computational creativity. There is what is called constructive machine learning, which is an area of machine learning interested in precisely developing machine learning algorithms that are able to navigate infinite space or very, very large space like the space you have when you create an object. So there are lots of things going on with very powerful models. And I think it's really the right, right time to look at that. And the remaining problems we have for generation of music, basically I have just pointed to the, the two I think are most, most important. The first one is high level structure. We have no idea how to generate an A, A, B, A. Of course, very easy to generate A, B, A. You say generate an A, generate a B, and then that's it, you know? But the thing is, how can you generate, a, can you design a system that, that has this idea of doing A, A, B, A, or A, B, A, B, or whatever? So how can you generate high-level structure that, that, that's uh, somehow related to the content, not mapped, uh, of course, uh, arbitrarily, which is something we can do? Uh, this is really hard, this is very hard, and uh, of course, there are lots of model attention models and uh, you know memory models and stuff like that that are interesting, but they do not solve that problem. It's probably, probably, probably much harder. The problem that's really interesting for us is this one. So because when you compose music, actually, it's not true that you compose a lead sheet, you know, where you have notes and stuff, and then you go to the studio and you think about sound. Obviously, it doesn't work like that. Everything is uh, mixed together. And even if people don't play, don't play with sound when they, don't, when, they, when they compose, they still have the sound in their uh, you know, mind. And so the interaction between the ren rendering of the sound of the guitar, the piano, the whatever, and the score is, of course, very, very uh, important. And no one is working on that today. <laughs> no one. People are working on symbolic generation. Some people are working on audio production. Some people are working on audio generation. No one is working on the relation between these two things. And to me, this is uh, the hot topic of uh, you know, the next topic uh, to study. Sorry, I've been a bit long. Thank you very much.